Thank you very much. I would like to start with thanking the organizers for inviting me to have this talk. And um, yes, uh, I changed the, the order, regional politics and acoustic studies, be just because the acoustic studies are coming more to the end of the presentation, so that you don't si sit there and think, when are those echograms coming? <laughs> so, um, my background is um, that I'm a marine ecologist and I work both in the Baltic Sea and in the Arctic Ocean. My interests are biodiversity and food web interactions. And my Arctic projects, they deal with sea ice microbes and fish acoustics in the central Arctic Ocean. You will see this abbreviation more often, CAO. It says Central Arctic Ocean. Um, I'm also involved in a number of expert assi assignments and uh, the first one is IESC, which is the International Arctic Science Committee, where I represent Sweden in the marine group, the marine working group. Uh, through IESC, I have been observer in Arctic Council task forces and in working groups. Um, I've also been a co-organizer only two weeks ago for a PAIM workshop, and PAIM is a working group within the Arctic Council, where we discussed uh, MPA networks in the Arctic Ocean, and MPAs, as you heard before, is marine protected areas. Then I also participate in the FISH CAO meetings of scientific experts on fish stocks in the central Arctic Ocean. And uh, these meetings of experts, here I represent the European Union, and uh, this is uh, giving advice on uh, future fishery activities in the central Arctic Ocean. And I will share some experiences here with you on both these things. So the international work and the uh, fish acoustics research project. So my study area is in the center of the Arctic Ocean and it's mainly north of 84 degrees. And uh, this environment is very extreme. We have in summer, well, between minus five and zero degrees in the air and 24 four hours light each day. And in winter, we have minus 40 degrees, can be even a little colder, and 24 hours darkness. Um, there is a permanent ice cover in the area that is called the Central Arctic Ocean of about two to three, three and a half meters thick. When it's three and a half meters, it's, it is uh, pack ice multi-year ice. Uh, there is a strong stratification in the water column in this area because of the Atlantic water coming in. There's also water coming in from the Pacific, so there's different layers of salinity and temperature. Another thing that is very typical for this area is that it is far away from land, and that makes that it is ultra-oligotrophic. So there are very little nutrients in the water, which means a low productive system. And in this extreme environment, it's the microbes that drive the system. Uh, it is uh, phototrophic, mixotrophic, heterotrophic algae and bacteria that are at the bottom of the food chain that provide the system with um, with, with uh, food from um, the lower trophic level. Uh, as everybody knows, this area is very much influenced by climate change, and that means that the permanent ice cover, the one that is three, three and a half meters thick, is disappearing very, very fast, and it is replaced by a seasonal melting cycle. So in the winter, we still have ice, everywhere and then in the summer it starts melting and these cycles they are uh, changing the whole system from completely ice covered all the time to these melting cycles and the arctic 
uh, ocean is also influencing the global climate uh, through uh, reflection of solar radiation from the ice masses and the uh, changing o ocean circulation. So what does the North Pole look like? Well, actually, you don't know that you're e exactly on the North Pole when you once are there. You just stare at an instrument, at uh, the bridge of uh, the icebreaker, which tells you, OK, now we're very close. And then the captain decides we are there, because if we move the ship a little bit, we maybe uh, lose it. So everybody's staring at this. And outside, it looks like this. This is uh, 2012. Sometimes when um, you have a research icebreaker visiting, it looks like this. And some people, they start doing things they have always been dreaming of. <laughs> we are 3,422 kilometers from Stockholm. And that's about the same distance as from Stockholm to southern Spain. Other people do like this. I've never wanted to swim here, but many do. Here is one who tries to look as if it's very easy to swim here, but it's very, very cold. And some, they try to sell hot dogs. Um, the question is, is there any fish under the ice at the North Pole? And that has to do also with the, the, the question, it, will it be worthwhile fishing here in the future when the ice disappears? And which species do we have, and how many, and what do they eat, and where do they spawn? Actually, nobody knows anything here. Well, a little, a few things, but not much. The ice is melting. Look at the color of the ice. It is so blue. It's very beautiful. Uh, this is what it looks from the air. Looked from the air 2012, and that was a year when we had a lot of melting ponds on and this is not very far from the North Pole, so this is showing the melting process. Uh, the Ice Edge, that's the area which is still relatively close to land, and that is where you find most of the charismatic fauna of the Arctic Ocean. And that's also where you have the productive area. So we have actually a, a system where the the, the highly productive area is moving with the ice edge. It's very rare that you meet polar bears in the center of the Arctic Ocean at the North Pole. Uh, so, when I talk about the central Arctic Ocean, this is the area that is the deep part of the Arctic Ocean, the basin itself, and it is uh, deeper than 3,000 meters in, uh, for example, the Fram Basin. And there are also some underwater mountain, underwater mountain ridges, and the most famous one is the Lomonosov Ridge, from which is all the way from northern Greenland to Russia. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is subdivided in large marine ecosystems, and this is what Another working group in the Arctic Council uses as a definition of the Arctic seas and uh, the, the working group CAF. And uh, here you see that the Arctic cycle is, um, I don't know if you can see, it, it, it is here. And there are also seas, the Bering Sea, for example, the Hudson Bay, which actually are outside the uh, Arctic cycle, but they are also taking in taken into the work in CAF. And I don't know really why certain areas are in or out, but that's a decision that has been made. But the most important part here is the Central Arctic Ocean, because that's what I will talk about most. The size is 3.3 square kilometers, million square kilometers. It's only a very small portion of the Earth's surface but it's larger than the Mediterranean Sea. It's about the size of India. And to get there, you need a strong icebreaker. And we have one, we have Odin. And here you see Odin busy 
breaking ice with a very special system. With um, when the, the ice is very thick, the uh, seawater is uh, is put on the ice to to uh, to soften the ice, and then Odin backs and goes through even big ridges. Uh, I looked a little bit at the uh, scientific publications made about the Central Arctic Ocean, and uh, actually, publication didn't start before 1990. And uh, since then, it has accelerated, as you see. Um, Sweden and Germany are two very uh, productive countries in this area because they have two strong icebreakers, Odin and then we have the Polar Stern from Germany. Uh, and um, there are also uh, coastal states who produce a lot of uh, publications about the Central Arctic Ocean, for example, Norway and North America, there's Canada and the USA together. But these people, they, they also do a lot of research in the shelf seas. And that's what, no, what we do not do a lot. So Europe, through Sweden and Germany, is mainly working in the, the central Arctic Ocean. But there's very little written about fisheries. And I mean, this is just a very fast search in the web of science. And I found only nine papers which mention fisheries. So that's very, very little. Uh, and then we come to what are the problems with the central Arctic Ocean? What do we know about the fish in the central Arctic Ocean? And can we pr prevent another tragedy of the commons? That means that nobody and everybody owns this part of the ocean, and there is no regulated fisheries, etc. So these three things I will go through now. Uh, first, uh, a picture that shows that the global temperature at the Earth's surface has gone up with 0.6 degrees since the 50s, or well, over the last 50 years, and that this process is not globally uniform, that warming is much higher in the Arctic. In the Arctic, the temperature has, on average, gone up by 3 degrees, so that's five times more than the global average. So, globally, the warming hotspots are found in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, why do we have more global warming in the Arctic? Well, global warming is uh, caused by human-induced changes in the reflectivity of the Earth and by the, the discharge of greenhouse gases like uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, that changes the balance between the energy entering and leaving the Earth's system. In the Arctic, we have something that is called the Arctic amplification. And that has to do that when the ice melts, there is sea, open sea, and that's darker than the ice. And so, this is called the albedo effect. So the the sun sun's energy is absorbed in these open waters, and that accelerates the melting process. Then there are other processes which have to do with, with uh, that ice is transported out of the Arctic Ocean through the um, um, uh, close to Svalbard, through the Fram Street, and uh, there are all kinds of meteorological feedback uh, cycles which are associated with water temperature and water vapor and clouds that also influence this process. So it is complicated, but the sum of it is that the warming is higher in the Arctic. So here you can see uh, that there is the, are these dark spots in between the white spots. So the, 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 the white uh, snow-covered ice reflects the sun, the, 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 the dark uh, areas, they absorb the sunlight. 
And this uh, process has been going on for quite a while, and it's accelerating, and by now we have already lost, some, according to some estimations, 80% of the ice, sea ice volume. So that's quite a lot we only have in the summer, and so that we have only 20% left. So the ice volume, this means that the ice is also thinning. It's not just disappearing by area, it's also thinning a lot. And then uh, two weeks ago we discussed very much when will we have an ice-free North Pole in the summer. And well, this, this is very much dependent on what the politicians decide. It, it, it is... Uh, it is the, the models, they have insecurities, but the largest insecurity is the, the uh, human society. So, in some years, and this is 2012, the year where I showed some photographs from, uh, when we were also in the Arctic, uh, the already a large part of the, the central Arctic Ocean close to the Pacific side, has been ice-free for some weeks in summer. And that means that fishery fleets from Asia easily can go in here. So the, the yellow line is, is the average for 30 years, and the, the white area is, is the area that was left in the middle of summer in the Central Arctic Ocean. And for some, this opens opportunities commercial fisheries, shipping, oil, gas, mineral, minerals, uh, tourism, etc. And then we come to problem two, who owns what? And uh, there are five countries who have an exclusive economic zone in the Arctic Ocean, and that's Russia, it's uh, the United States, Canada, Norway, and the Kingdom of Denmark. And Three of them, they claim parts of the Lomonosov Ridge, this, this mountain chain in the middle. And Russia has already planted a flag uh, seven years ago or so in, on the North Pole, that they own the North Pole. Because even if it is still ice covered, it's very difficult to go there, it's unexploited. But maybe sometime in the future, there's something to get there. Uh, 25% of the Arctic Ocean, or 80% of this central basin, are today beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, it means that they are owned by nobody and everybody. And there are many countries who are interested in future exploitation, including fisheries. And then we talk about the high seas area of the Arctic Ocean. The high seas means uh, any area, anywhere on Earth where uh, that is not um, uh, within economic zones of specific countries. So it is, it's the international waters. And when you look at the uh, uh, Arctic high seas, there is a lot of overlap with the um, uh, Central Arctic Ocean large marine ecosystem, except that some of the... Um, of the shelf areas. It has less shelf areas here, but in the Chukchi Sea here, it has uh, a shallower area. Uh, problem three is how to manage the ecosystem in the Arctic Ocean, the Central Arctic Ocean. Well, we have a lot of good instruments uh, that have been developed during the last 20 years, like ecosystem-based management, mar maritime spatial planning, marine protected areas, etc. But to do this, you need international cooperation. And we are very, very far from this in the Arctic Ocean, I have understood. If you look at the Baltic Sea, we have all these organizations, and most of them are governmental. It's for environmental protection, it is, is for uh, spatial planning, ministers of foreign affairs. The people meet and talk. And we even have an international research council, which has <coughs> uh, 120 million euros uh, for research 
in the years 2009 to 2020. Uh, we ICS is working there. Uh, we have um, a lot of communication and contact. But in the Arctic, there are no legally binding international agreements. For, for example, HELCOM in the, in the Baltic Sea, that's, that, that is at the governmental level. But the, nothing is in place. And the Arctic Council is, doesn't want to have to do with fisheries. They, they, um, the Arc one of the biggest rules the Arctic Council has is that we don't interfere with other people's uh, economic zones. So uh, they don't want to be involved. Uh, the the uh, law of the sea, UNCLOS, is of course also applicable to the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, but it's, uh, and, and that's actually the only thing we have here. And um, there we can build in the precautionary approach, which is an advantage in communication. But it's not much. Uh, the five countries, the five coastal states, they have started to talk at the governmental level. And they uh, have made the Oslo declara Declaration in 2015. And that means that uh, commercial fishing in the end, they, they, ha they have written this paper and it says commercial fishing is unlikely in the near future. So there's no need to establish new management regimes at present. And uh, that is a truth with modification because it is uh, already open at the Pacific side. You can, people can go there. If they will do it, I don't know either because it is an extreme environment still. It's very cold, etc. Uh, but the, these countries, they authorize their vessels to conduct commercial fishing in the area only when it has some relationship with management organizations. B so, but this is not a binding thing, so it is not a fishing moratorium at the moment. But they want to make it one. And in the, in the uh, um, discussions, they have also now involved the EU, and also the uh, Asian countries, South Korea, China, Japan, and also Iceland. And um, that's where we are at the moment, at the governmental level. And there will be a meeting very, very soon, and they will hopefully come to an agreement. But last time we also thought that, and it, it is uh, especially one country that is very much against interference, like binding rules for their own uh, sake. So, uh, then we have this expert, expert group where I am part of, and we meet uh, also once a year like the politicians, and then we give advice. So what we did last year in Tromsø was that we made a synthesis of knowledge about the Central Arctic Ocean, of, of the fish in the Central Arctic Ocean. We made uh, some drafts for science plan, monitoring plan, and implementation plan. Next week, uh, we have a meeting in Ottawa, and then we are going to structure these uh, plans more. And we hope then also to get some money to, to and, and guidelines to get more research done on the things we need to know. So what do we know right now about the fish in the Central Arctic Ocean? Uh, this group made a uh, um, uh, synthesis, and there we looked at all the records in, in, in the international literature, but also from databases that are unpublished. And, but, and we came to the conclusion that these are the, the, the numbers of species that have been reported from the different seas around the Central Arctic Ocean, or the high seas, and this is the high seas. And in brackets, that's the fish species that can be of economic interest. So you see the highest number of species we have in 
the Barents Sea. Also quite a lot here in the Chukchi Sea, and that's where you have the contact with the Pacific and the Atlantic. But when you come inside the Arctic Ocean, it decreases a lot, and in the Central Arctic Ocean, only 12 species have been documented, and most of them only by one specimen. This is when you include, it's the same for the, the shelf seas, but in the center, now, you, now we follow the red line, which is the Central Arctic Ocean ecosystem. Then there are some more species, and that's because we include now also these shelf areas where you have more fish. Uh, these eight, sp eight fish species uh, are listed here. And here you see the number of observations. It's really very little. And also when you look at the, uh, where they were found, there are only three species that were found north of <coughs> 77 degrees, and that's still far away from the North Pole. And two of these species are actually called Arctic cod, and both are also called polar cod. And now we try to make a, a, a decision that this is polar cod and this is ice cod, but uh, people just use different names. Uh, what do we know about these two? Uh, well, one has very little economic value, and one has value as fish meal and as a source of oil. Both are creopelagic, they occur in the... And this is not what we know from the Central Arctic Ocean these days, this is what we know from the shelf seas around it, where they occur. Uh, this one is 40 centimeters maximum and this 30 centimeters maximum. Both have a swim bladder uh, with gas, so that means uh, that you can trace them with acoustics. Uh, Boreogadus is highly abundant in the shelf seas, and it can even form schools, while Arctogadus is much less abundant. And both have an Arctic circumpolar uh, distribution, but the range of Arctogadus is much smaller. Uh, both feed on crustaceans and fishes, and uh, they are preyed upon by whales, seabirds, seals. The other interesting species is Greenland halibut, which is found in the Central Arctic Ocean, but only two, I think, one or two uh, specimens, and they were found at 75 degrees north. Uh, but... Um <coughs> It is possible that this is one of the species. It, it is, it's a benthopelagic species, uh, so you can catch it in pelagic fishing. And uh, this maybe is one of the species that can, when climate change proceeds, move north. The other nine are perch-like fishes and scorpion fishes. Uh, and you see, this is, there's only one, and that's the one we heard this morning already about also the gelatinous snailfish that is uh, found very much to the north. And all the others are found more to the south, and these are benthic fishes. They are also very small, so they, and they are not uh, interesting for fishing. So... Uh, when we come to the biomass, here we even know less than when we talk number of species. In the Central Arctic Ocean, we know nothing, and uh, these are uh, numbers that we could find uh, in the literature, but it's uh, uh, very difficult to get a complete overview because there are many areas where we don't know anything. Uh, the Greenland halibut, yeah, I put it here, but you can see this, this is a, a, a more uh, interesting fish than the uh, cod. So um, 
but it, it is one that is not documented from the Central Arctic Ocean. So here we have the key species, Boyo Gardasida, one species, the only one as we know right now. Uh, it has an intermediate trophic position, so it's, it's central in the food web, and you can see it here. <laughs> this is a, a food web in the Central Arctic Ocean at the ice edge. Uh, there you see, th there is a lot of life, but the polar cod is extremely important. So, the major question is, is there a population? in the deep water of the high seas, under the permanent ice cover, or is this just a spillover from spawning areas in the shelf seas? And uh, uh, to answer this question, we need very urgently to make genetic and acoustic studies. Um, what we know today is that there is a recent uh, publication, and this is a very interesting key publication, I think. They found Boyogardus associated with pack ice in the Central Arctic Ocean, and it was feeding on ice amphipods, and they presented the hypothesis that this sea ice is a nursery habitat, and it is drifting from the sp spawning areas in the Laptevenkara Sea to the Central Arctic Ocean. And so there, there you have a seed that can maybe form a population, but then it would still be genetically the same population as you have in the spawning areas in the Laptevenkara Sea. There are some visual observations and sonar observations from submarines, but not very specific. It's like fish, we saw fish. Uh, there are some studies from already from the 60s with eco-sounders on drifting ice stations who show just scattering layers, but they don't are not very precise either. And there are no previous quantitative observations in the water column. So, by coincidence, and this is really a story that that. Uh, is, is a happy story. Uh, the geologists at Stockholm University have planted an echo load, uh, an echo sounder, on board of Odin 2014. And uh, they wanted to see methane bubbles from in the water column just above the sea bottom. And they, they, they um, uh, bought an echo load which is perfect for fish. So, when I was sitting in this first fish CAO meeting, I immediately thought, oh, what, do they, what instrument do they So I contacted Martin Jakobson, and he said, yeah, you can get the data. So, great, we have data from this echo sounder from an expedition in 2014 and from an expedition in 2016. And this is the most interesting one, because that's the one going all the way to the North Pole. The other one is also interesting, but this uh, is the one we started with. And in this project, uh, we have Martin and Katharina Gorfeld, who has provided the, the data for the, the oceanographics, and then this is a, col a, a collaboration with the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen, where we have four collaborators and two more, actually, who, who all have their very good competence in uh, fish acoustics. And um, with the help of that, we, we were able to get some, some data out of the data. And... Uh, uh, we have this uh, ECO-80 uh, instrumentation we used in 2018. Uh, the data seem to be extremely noisy by mechanical noise when breaking the ice. Uh, and uh, for also from disturbances from other equipment, they were operating on board of Odin, and there was uh, an electrical noises, and they came probably from the propellers, which means that most of the material we cannot use. 
But fortunately, geologists, they want to take cores, and that takes time, and then the ship lies still. And so we have about 10, maybe 15 stations very close to the North Pole, where we have uh, a good view of what is in the water column. And uh, after saving these data with all kinds of filters, we found that we could use uh, echograms until at some places uh, one kilometer of depth, and even also in some from the upper 300 meters. And a big surprise there is that we have evidence for abundant fish at the North Pole. Uh, there are single fish traces, but some also loose, forming loose layers. And in some echograms, there are schools of something. And there we cannot say, is it fish or is it plankton? But uh, we have at least evidence for life there, and it's not just a single fish. Uh, we don't know which species it is, but it's probably based on the knowledge that we have that it, it, it should be Boreogardus. And the quantitative analysis are going on, and we will publish this very soon, as it, as it is now, just to have the first record of, yes, there is abundant fish here. This is what a typical echogram of the raw data looks like. And uh, there you see absolutely nothing. But with filtering, you can see the fish, and each of these uh, is, is a fish. And this is at 98.25 north. We have uh, also an example here from uh, another North Pole sample from the upper layer. But what we mainly have is data from the mesopelagic layer, where we see the fish. We also see here a school of something. And these schools can be plankton, but it can also be fish. So we, we have to, to look a little bit deeper into this. But what we can conclude, perfect, is that there is clearly a need for more acoustic work, because this is only a very little snapshot. And uh, we need to data with higher quality, we must identify the species, we need to sample fish, we need to be there in different seasons. And, yes, we have an expedition going on. It's the Mosaic expedition. In 2019 to 2020, the uh, polar stern will be frozen into the ice at the Russian side, and it will come out of the ice one year later, as if the calculations fit on the other side, and it will go over the North Pole. So here we have a, a possibility that we are well be prepared to target fish. So that means that we will have more high resolution data, we will have more pings, because the, the geologists use very slow rate. Uh, the ship will be stationary, it will be frozen into the ice, it will not have the engines on. Great. We, c we, we also discuss with the other scientists, when are you using your equipment so that we don't disturb each other. So all these preparations are right now going on, and we will get year-round data. So this is a fantastic possibility to, to get the data. Well, to the last then. Can we prevent another tragedy of the commons? Well, I have only one slide for this, and, but we can conclude there is a polar cod, probably, fish population in the North Pole, at the North Pole. We don't know about the spawning, nothing, but they live there. And that makes also it attractive to fish there, maybe, in the near future. And it would be really terrible if you would dis destroy this ecosystem, take its key species for some fish meal. We know all of that. Uh, the Central Arctic Ocean suffers from a lack of information at all trophic levels. 
we know it's an extremely vulnerable ecosystem with a few highly adapted species. It faces critical changes which are drastic and unprecedented. We don't have an ultra-oligotrophic, high-latitude, ice-free ecosystem yet. We might get it now, but we don't have it yet. It will stay also oligotrophic. There will, where, where otherwise would the nutrients come from? It will be very difficult to, to, it is very difficult to predict how this system will work. But we have experiences from other low diversity ecosystems with a few species. For example, the Baltic Sea. The, the, the Central Arctic Ocean is even more extreme, but we know we have experience. What, we have, what have we learned from the mistakes we have made elsewhere? And when we take this into account, it would of course be stupid to start fishing without any regulations. So, binding regulations are necessary, and this also counts for the shelf seas, where the spawning areas are, etc. Uh, the, the Central Arctic Ocean would need an international environment, environmental protection agency, ICS should come in. We would also need a research council that, that provides money to scientists for doing joint research there. To, to, so that research is not fragmented over different countries, etc. And the best thing to would, would be to make the Arctic high seas one big marine protected area, of course. It is double the size of the marine protected area in the Ross Sea. So uh, I think if we are clever, we do this. But it's not we who decide, it's the international political process, and I think they are far too slow. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>